Mast, Mercy Association in Scripture and Theology, presents Exploring Critical Concerns Through the Lens of Nonviolence with Hope. We have four presentations. The first of these is by Helen Marie Burns, and it is titled Sisters of Mercy and Nonviolence, Revisionist History or Historical Development. Helen Marie has served in mercy leadership at the local and institute level. She is an educator through and through and has been involved in academic life from the classroom to the boardroom. She has sharp eyes for when something is askew and a creative mind for mercy possibilities. All right, good. Thank you very much, Mary Paula. Thank you for that gracious introduction. And uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity uh, to reflect on nonviolence in the story of the Sisters of Mercy. But I think it's always just a bit dangerous whenever we try to connect a contemporary event or a contemporary issue with our own history, because there are two dangers, I think. One is that we get into revisionist history, uh, which is really about interpreting the past through the lens of our current experience. And it's always done usually in a manner that favors a particular social or political agenda. So uh, like early on in the feminist movement, we wanted to claim Catherine as a feminist. I mean, I understand there's a, a way in which that's true, but it's a little bit of revisionist history since the whole concept of feminism came later than Catherine's own life experience. So I wanna to try to avoid the revisionist approach. There's also, of course, the developmental approach, which is much more appropriate, uh, tracing the history of an idea through time, through space. And um, the problem here is that when, when one's time is limited and the project is quite extensive, and would require careful research over many uh, volumes and many uh, hours, uh, it, it becomes almost impossible. So let me just say right from the beginning that I'm gonna avoid both of those by using a different methodology. And it's the methodology really of T.S. Eliot, who suggests in Dry Salvages, when he's talking about incarnation, he says, you know, there are hints and guesses. <laughs> And the rest is prayer, observance, and discipline. So I'm just looking for hints and guesses in the story of mercy that relate us, or at least ground us, in the concept of nonviolence. And I want to say that there's receptive grounding in our story. So we don't have to be afraid of that. There is receptive grounding. I'll make some observations concerning what mercy spirituality brings to the practice and how we personally and our spiritual and corporal works of mercy, especially systemically, challenge us in this practice of nonviolence. And all of that in 15 minutes, which is what we've been asked to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right. So you understand, it'll all be done rather, rather, uh, um, well, I don't want to say surfacely, but certainly it would be done quickly. All right, hints. Uh, let's begin by stating the obvious. Catherine Macaulay was not a pacifist. No, neither she nor the early Sisters of Mercy were practitioners of nonviolence, not at least as we understand it, the phenomena today that came from Gandhi, that came from Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, other prominent practitioners. It's a 20th century phenomenon. It's a late 19th century phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon that was familiar to Catherine or her sisters in Ireland. However, we do also have some hints and guesses in the life of Catherine, in her values and in her attitudes that suggest fertile ground for embedding, sowing this practice of nonviolence. We know that William and Catherine Callahan were major influences in Catherine's early adulthood. So we can look to the Quaker tradition because we know that Catherine Callahan, especially, who was the Quaker in that relationship, um, shared with Catherine elements of her, of her Quaker faith. 
And that faith, we know that tradition is steeped in the practice of nonviolence. So if we were doing developmental history, we might be able to tease out from some of that early experience uh, direct relations to nonviolence, but we, we've got hints and guesses. Uh, Mary Sullivan notes in her The Path of Mercy, Catherine McCauley came to share more and more in the Quaker spiritual values and virtues of Catherine Callahan. And she goes on to observe that a great deal of Catherine Callahan's Quaker faith and spirit can be found in the early biographical manuscripts about Catherine Macaulay, and I suggest in the early influences of Catherine on the congregation. And again, Mary Sullivan points out, the, especially she says, we see the influence of Mrs. Callahan's charity, her appreciation of silence, and her devotion to reading Christian scripture. And certainly in the appreciation of silence and charity, inscription Christian scripture is, is fertile foundation for non practice of nonviolence. I think also the person of Catherine Macaulay offers another dimension of, of the hints of that this really relationship flourished in her person. Uh, we know that she's described often as having a tranquil spirit. We know that she had a appreciation, I would say, a careful sense of the use of power, which is at the heart of nonviolence. And she also had a consistent awareness deepened in her life experience with the sense of Christ in others. Uh, Sharon spoke uh, today or this morning about the thin places. I think for Catherine, especially in her later life, when her contemplative spirit was deepened and richly, richly um, I think kind of uh, transfiguring all of her life, uh, people, especially the poor, were thin places for her. They were revelatory in their experience and in her interaction with them. So talk about the tranquil spirit. An early biographer says of Catherine, she was never seen in a hurry. She seemed to have nothing to attend to, but the one matter in which at any moment she was seen occupied. And she performed that with the utmost quietness of manner. Quietness of manner. That definitely reflects a Quaker tradition, a centered spirit. It is also, I think, at the heart of any, if you've known persons practicing nonviolence, is at the center of that practice. We know also that her leadership rested on a model not of domination, but of mutuality. She, had, she used power very carefully. And biographers, biographers referred to her discussion of congregational business in the presence of the gathered community, young and old, newly committed, seasoned religious women. Everyone was somewhat around the table for Catherine in this exercise of power in the exercise of formation of a energy of the community. She also, we know, refused to adopt the title Reverend Mother. It implied a type of authority she did not wish to signify. And again, I think it hints at her model of leadership and use of power as one of mutuality. Since one definition of nonviolence is the personal practice of not causing harm to others under any condition, I think that's a helpful, actually, definition of nonviolence. The personal practice of not causing harm to others under any condition. I think we can look at Catherine's consistent effort not only to address the needs of others, which was very common in her life, the needs of those with whom she lived, as well as the needs of those with whom she served and among whom she served. But she did that without yielding judgment or offense. And that is often apparent in her letters. It's often apparent in the reflections of biographies. It was her intent not to create harm in solving, as it were, or addressing a need. So I think again, at the heart of a, a fertile ground, we wanna look at it for the practice of nonviolence. Catherine's belief in a God revealed as compassionate, and this goes to her scripture reading. She studied it and 
through the lens of the life of Jesus the Christ. Believe strongly in an incarnated God in that person of Jesus Christ. And therefore, her encounter with every human person was somewhat framed by a simple plan, very simple plan. Respond with tranquility and compassion, perceived action as she would expect Jesus would have done. I think um, Sister Angela Bolster does a good service for us when she talks about the mercy or Catherine spirituality. She says, Catherine spirituality was marked by her ability to create and maintain inner spiritual space. Again, an essential, I think, element of any practice of nonviolence. Make, creating and maintaining inner spiritual space, to be constantly aware of the mystery of God, to be able to find God's touch everywhere in the world of people, in the world of their occupations and of their miseries. So again, I think we can say that there's plenty of meat in our tradition and in the spirituality of Catherine as, and as the community and congregation picked up that spirituality for a development of the practice of nonviolence. Inner spiritual space for the Christian practice of nonviolence, the mystery of God is at the center. But also because of incarnation, it is practiced in a world of people, a world of creation, a world of systems. I'd like to think, and I'll just close with the sense of the congregation or Catherine, um, with this observation too. I think the tranquility of spirit in Catherine was both natural to her temperament. I suspect she was quiet by, by temperament and certainly perhaps by uh, her development as a young woman in, a, in, in circumstances that were oftentimes somewhat uh, oppressive. So I think there was that natural tendency, but more importantly, I think we need to recognize that the tranquil spirit rose out of her deliberate and intentional creation and practice of a contemplative stance, a contemplative spirit. She developed a habit of mind and heart that strove to see all things as possible conveyors, both of ultimate meaning and of potential eruptions of divine reality. We are talking in Catherine's life about contemplation as a way of ordinary life, reflected in a centered spirit in the midst of activity, attentive and aware of God's presence. And I think again, fertile ground or the practice of nonviolence. Because that, especially that contemplation and action is a piece of her legacy to the congregation. We might say her spiritual legacy. So it brings me then to the question of what mercy spirituality today brings to the practice or could bring to the practice of nonviolence. Here's my hope. <laughs> is that mercy brings, first of all, and someone I think, uh, Mary Paul, you, you set me up for this, um, a learner's stance. And then I think we need to realize the gift that we bring with our tradition of active religious life. We don't often reflect upon that, but it is, it, it is a gift we bring that both frees us for creativity and also kind of almost impels us to to change and to constantly develop in relation to the world in which we live. And then I think we need deeply and richly to think and develop a systemic understanding of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, as well as the works of justice. So let me in the little time that I have left here talk a little bit about the learner's stance. Mm -hmm. I love this quote from Gandhi. It's the acid test of nonviolence that in a nonviolent conflict, there is no rancor left behind. And in the end, the enemies are converted into friends. We do not have a history of the practice of nonviolence as congregation of mercy. 
We don't. We are doers. We are responders. We are change agents on behalf of persons in need. Our approach has been, for much of our history, direct service, and then we got into out of direct service, institutional service, into organizational service. Uh, we've struggled, we've proclaimed, we've denounced, and we've announced. Um, but I don't think we have always, in the end, converted our enemies into friends. I don't know that we've always even reflected on the possibility of that. So I think we enter into the whole practice of nonviolence. Now, I understand there are women among us who have been at this for, for a, a long while. We lost one of our great uh, practitioners in nonviolence in Barbara Craig from the uh, regional community, former regional community of uh, Dal in Dallas, Pennsylvania. But, but for the most part, it's not a part <clears throat> of the persona as a congregation. So I think we need to learn. We need to learn new disciplines of spirit and action. We need to learn new language patterns. We need to new forms of communication. Um, we have a rich history on which to build, in which to embed that learning, but we do begin, I think, as learners. But I also think that we can look and can rest on our tradition of active religious life. Whoops, excuse me because the very nature of the form of religious life which we operate in as a congregation <clears throat> has its identity in, the, in taking shape from the time and the circumstances in which it finds itself. There's freedom and flexibility and creativity embedded in the very form of religious life which we operate within. What response to need no longer serves our common purpose or our common energy vision. Excuse me. Now, how do I get back? We're almost always compelled to think newly. Let go, re-engage. What, what are the new responses? What no longer serves? To me, the practice of nonviolence seems the most appropriate response to contemporary needs. Adoris began this morning talking about our critical concerns, talking about the state of the world. If ever an age needed a witness of nonviolence, it certainly is, I think, our current age. And lastly, I'd like to say, let's begin to think and talk about the systemic understanding of our spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Because in doing that, I think, we begin and start with the very fact that at the heart of all our critical concerns, at the heart of the spiritual works of mercy, at the heart, if you understand it systemically, of these realities, there are systems of violence. There are systems of violence that create hunger they create homelessness, they create ignorance, they create imprisonment. So we need to continue, of course, the spiritual and corporate works of mercy as response to individual need. But I think we need to enlarge that and begin to think of the fact that we can, in our current age, think of these spiritual and corporate works of mercy systemically. We need to place my timer just went out, so I'm going to rush along. <laughs> we need to place um, our daily service in the context of a universe which entire people, where entire people suffer from ignorance, from hunger, from sickness. And in that context, realize that burying the dead can refer to innumerable species within our ecosystem. Clothing the naked can be talking about land and foliage as well as people. There are violent systems, ecclesiastical, political, economic, which imprison people as effectively as any buildings do. That's what we need to begin to look at and, 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 and recognize the violence at the heart of each of our spiritual and corporate works of mercy. And then with our practice of nonviolence, move outward to heal that reality. What, for example, would the first of the corporal works of mercy instructing the ignorant look like? 
through the lens of systemic rather than individual response to need. Ignorance rests in the most educated of persons when we talk about misinformation, when we talk about fake news. Do you see where I'm going here? Yes. We have plenty of opportunity for understanding that work of mercy in the reality of systemic change. There are people who deliberately choose not to know because knowing implies a responsibility they do not wish to bear. Many writers in today's political and social orders are crying out for a both and mindset which strives to discover solutions to conflicts in which everyone benefits. Mary Paula talked to us about this. Everyone benefits somewhat and no one benefits entirely. I think such an approach is at the heart of the practice of nonviolence and such thinking and connecting will require imagination and awareness. Catherine was a woman of her time. She incarnated God's mercy in her time. Her story provides a model that asks no more, no less from each of us. Mercy coupled with the practice of nonviolence may be both the promise and the pathway to healing a fragmented, war-weary, possession-burdened, struggling cosmic reality. I say it's least worth a try. Thank you. Thank you.